Well, it is our fourth week in our series, Asking for a Friend, which is, uh, we had fun with this one because it's one of those things where you ever say, like, I- I'm curious, you have your own question, but you don't want to admit that it's your question, so you, uh, I have a friend who's wondering. We're asking for a friend here, and so what we did a couple, about, what, two months ago, we said, hey, submit the questions. What are the, what are the things that you're wondering about, things that you've wrestled with or, or, or struggled with uh, when it comes to faith, the Bible, church history? We didn't get any church history questions, but that's all right. Uh, I like church history. So you submitted questions, and over the last few weeks, we've had an opportunity to, to address those. Now, it's very different than how I normally approach uh, my time in, in, in the pulpit, where I, uh, like we, we, we preach through books, or even if we do a, a topical series, there's, there's a passage. I want to land on a main passage and kind of work through. But I, I said this when we first started. Instead of like biblical like exegesis and exposition, we're, we're going to be doing systematic theology, where you take a topic and you, and you pull from different parts of the Bible to address and understand that topic better. And that's what we've been doing over the last few weeks, and we're going to do it again today. However, we're going to add a little church history, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, <laughs> all the way back to the first century, the 1500s, and, and, and the early, 19, early 20th century. So uh, we'll get there. Today's question, if we just want to get to it, is what does the Bible say and what does Radiant believe about spiritual gifts? Now, I'd like to say Radiant believes what the Bible says. That's the right answer, right? But it's not that easy because there are brothers and sisters who, who since uh, in Christ, uh, there, is, there are stripes of, of, of Christianity that, that don't agree necessarily on what spiritual gifts says. And when, when you ask the question about what does Radiant believe, well, Radiant's not a a single person. Radiant is the people. And, and I said this from, you've heard me say this before, uh, we are interdenominational in makeup. And I, I think that's a beautiful part of who we are as a church, but we are strategically aligned with the Assemblies of God. So uh, in missions and resources, I think it's the best missions program that, that, that's out there in terms of sending missionaries and, and just there's no other place I'd rather support than, than that. It is a network, but it also gives us a doctrinal baseline. So there is room for differences. There's room for for not agreeing on every line. There is a a Lutheran, uh, in the 17th century, a Lutheran theologian in Germany. His name is Rupertus Meldinius. And you know this quote, you just didn't know his name. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. There's room, there's charity in the non-essentials, or, uh, there's, there's liberty as well. So, there, but, the, but, but we do have this baseline, and, and also the, there's a credentialing of ministers. That's why, like, you need a, the Constitution and Bibles of this church say that the pastor has to have credentials with the Assemblies of God. So, we're not an institution, but we do have Constitution and Bylaws, so in that sense, we do have this theological baseline. Now, I say there's a spectrum of uh, the understanding of spiritual gifts. Brothers and sisters, sincerely seeking the Lord, different traditions, different stripes of Christianity, in particular evangelical Christianity. And so there's two schools of thought on, there's, on this spectrum. There's, there's on one side what you would call cessationism. I'm sorry, my mouth is like glued together. That always means I'm nervous, right? I think it does. Four and a half years of experience. Uh, cessationism is on one end. Cessationism, uh, and then there's continuationism. Cessationism would say that spiritual gifts such as speaking in tongues, prophecy, healing, ceased in the apostolic age, so the first hundred years or so of Christianity, of the church. Excuse me. Really, they're saying that the sign gifts, the miraculous type of gifts that we read about in the book of Acts that we've been going through, the, the doctrine is really a doctrine that came out of the, the, the Protestant Reformation. So we're talking 1500s, Martin Luther, in particular, John Calvin. So uh, it's called Reformed Theology, also known, as you might know it as Calvinism. John Calvin kind of really uh, parsing out uh, the, the, the doctrine of the Reformation and, and, and the first Protestants to, to come out of uh, the Catholic Church at that time. Luther didn't necessarily want to start a Lutheran church. He just wanted to reform the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church is like, we're kicking you out. John Calvin comes after him. And then we have 
uh, your Reformed theology churches, your Presbyterians, your Baptist, things like that, your Reformed churches. Now, what's interesting is before the 1500s, before John Calvin, before the Reformation, the church only was continuationism, that the spirits continued and they were, they were applicable uh, for 1,500 years, there was, no, there was no need to have the word continuationism because there was no cessationism. There was like, the Spirit is still at work. He's still doing what we read about in the Bible. Now, in practice, you didn't see a whole lot of it, but you saw pockets here and there. There was a group that was, there was a revival. There was there were tongues over here. There was healings over here. And in fact, the Catholic Church is really big on the miraculous. And the Catholic Church looked at the Protestant, Reforma- the, Re- the Protestant churches that came out of the Reformation and said, well, look, we have these miracles. This is a sign that we're legit and you guys are, have broken off from the true church. Now, in response to that, John Calvin really began to, to dig into this doctrine of cessationism. Now, even within cessationism, there is a spectrum. So there's a spectrum within a spectrum. Let me give you, I have to, re- I had to, read, this, I have to read this to you. There are what's called full cessationists, which believes all miracles and miraculous gifts have ceased. All miracles? I don't know. That's, that's full. There's classical cessationists, which would say the sign gifts, such as prophecy, healing, speaking in tongues, ceased with the apostles and with the canon of Scripture being closed, like the New Testament, you know, it's boom, here's the New Testament. Now we have Scripture identified, we don't need the miraculous anymore because we have God's word. And, and there's a couple of texts, honestly, I think it's a weak argument uh, as far as the canon is concerned, and we'll reference that text in a little bit. But they would still say that even though those things have ceased, God still works occasionally in mer- supernatural, miraculous ways. Uh, so God's still at work. He's, miracles haven't totally ceased. God's sovereign, he'll do what he wants. Then there's consistent cessationists. Now they are consistent. You can get, kind of guess what this is about. They would say not only are the miraculous gifts only for the, the establishment of the first century church, the, the offices that we read about that God has given to the church in Ephesians chapter 4, those things have ceased too. Like not just apostles and prophets. He would say that the, 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 cons- uh, the consistent cessationists would say there's no longer even a need for the office of pastor teacher, evangelist. And then there's what's called concentric cessationists, which says that miracles have ceased in established churches in areas that have been evangelized, but yet they exist on the fringes of where the gospel is going. So like your missionary endeavors to unreached people who have never heard the gospel, that God is still performing those miraculous miracles because it's in aid of the gospel spreading. So you have this number of different views of the gifts not being for today in some form or fashion. Then you have continuationism. Can you guess what that's about? It's continuing. It's a belief that the Holy Spirit has continued into the present age. His gifts have continued to the present age. And I already mentioned this kind of, you know, cessationism arose in the Reformation and continuationism, which never had to be defined prior arose in response to cessationism. Now, it's largely associated with what I believe God has done over in the 20th century. I, I believe we are in the last days. I believe the Holy Spirit has moved in a number of waves, of what, what people call moves of the Spirit, waves of the Spirit, where there's been a restoration of gifts that, you know, we never said they, they didn't exist, but there wasn't, there was just pockets and moments where you would hear uh, of the Spirit's work but in the early 20th century, you had the, the Pentecostal movement that was born out of the, the holiness movement, the revivalism of the Second Great Awakening in the 19th century. Uh, Pentecostalism today is the fastest growing segment of Christianity around the world. I believe God is reaching the world through empowered, uh, an empowered church. In the 1960s, you have the charismatic renewal this was, this was people in mainline churches, the Catholic Church uh, and, and mainline Protestant denominations that began to become open to, to the gifts of the Spirit, the things that we read about. They weren't going to start their own denominations. They were going to stay in their church and kind of live out 
uh, those things in their church. And then in the 1980s, you have what's called the third wave. So you have wave one, wave two, wave three, the neo-charismatics, uh, which are harder to find because they're just harder to find. It's kind of a broad group. But you may, you may know the Jesus people of the 70s, late 60s, 70s. Well, by the time the 80s came around, they bought buildings and started establishing churches. We know them as the Vineyard Church or Calvary Chapel Churches. They don't want to be called Pentecostal or Charismatic. They want to be evangelicals who are open to the Spirit. So uh, that's kind of who we think about when we think about the recovery or the, the, the you know, renewal of the gifts of the Spirit. But really, any tradition that doesn't say that the Spirit, that this gifts have ceased is part of this continuationism. The Roman Catholic Church, uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, initially the Lutherans, who now have more of a middle ground, saying we're open but cautious. The Anglicans, which is actually kind of a mix. And then out of the Anglicans came the Methodists, which came that, you know, that Pentecostal movement came, came out of Methodism uh, and the Moravian Church. So you see there's, there's a broad group of Christians of, of all stripes that think the Spirit's still at work. Those gifts are still in play. Now, I'll be honest with you, both camps, both camps have strengths and weaknesses. Both camps lean on their tradition, their experience, and their theological bias when it comes to approaching Scripture and the spiritual gifts. It's easy for someone who's a cessationist to be critical of someone who's a continuationist because it's some strange fire that they have no background, no experience with. It's easy for them to, to, to want to be drawn to a theology that, that helps affirm their experience in church. So it's like, here's my experience. Let me, let me build my theology to justify and, and, and say, I'm right. <laughs> No, no one wants to feel like what they believe is wrong. On the flip side, continuationist, continuationism can be critical of cessationists for not believing the whole Bible. Like, you know, and there's almost an arrogance, if I could be honest with you, when it comes to Pentecostal charismatics. Like, we, we got the whole gospel. It's not my favorite phase, but it gets thrown around. That's, that's somewhat of an arrogant view of it because the gifts aren't for the elite, which we're going to see. We can be, the continuationists can be critical of cessationists for not believing the whole Bible, yet I believe Pentecostals fall short of applying the whole, the whole Bible when it comes to the gifts because, and we're going to see this in 1 Corinthians 14, I think we allow for cultural Pentecostalism to rule our experience, our tradition, the way it was, the way I was raised, the way I'd like for it to be, rather than let's apply Scripture fully. So having said that, saying there's, there's issues, there's a bias that colors our, our, our approach to Scripture, I want to open God's Word today with some humility, and not just an openness to what God would say, but an expectation that God is going to challenge us in some way and meet us today. In his word. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, normally if we're looking at one main text, I'd give you a little background. Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He gave us the, like the best explanation of grace and, and, and salvation. That's why some of you grew up learning about the Romans road to share your faith. Martin Luther, the reformer, said if we, all, if we lost all the books of the Bible but John and Romans, we'd still be good as the church. Here's what he says in, in verse in chapter 12, 3 through 8. Now, there are two main, really main passages when we think of gifts. And we're going to look at those two passages first, of, first off. Romans 12, 3 through 8 says this, and this is kind of more of the Spirit's gifting. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think yourself better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measure yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we also belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If, the, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. 
If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, gener- if it is giving give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Just a real quick survey of this text. Uh, in verse 3, you, you'll see, don't think of yourself higher than you ought to. What is he saying? Like, we approach the gifts with some humility. It's not a, look at me, I'm elite, I'm operating in gifts, which happened, and we're going to get there. It happened in the early church in the first century. There's a humility, uh, recognizing that the gifts that God gives come by his grace. Verse 6. Verse 6 has this word grace, which is charis, you know, charisma, uh, charismatic, for, for, it comes from the word charisma. In his grace, God has given us, well, in his grace, that means we're getting something that we do not deserve. We, the gifts that God has given us, the, 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 the giftings he's given us, is not something that we deserved or earned, it's by his grace. He's given us different gifts. And this word is Charis, charisma, but it's, it's the same root word, it's charismata, which is a gift of grace. That the gifts he's given us are gifts that come by grace. We do not deserve them. Now, this word is also used of other things like salvation in Romans 6. Uh, salvation is a gift of grace. But so are the spiritual gifts that are being addressed here. And the list, which by the way, if you're a cessationist, you would approve this list because it's not the miraculous sign gifts. Prophecy, which I went to a Baptist seminary, they would say, well, that's teaching. Serving, teaching, exhorting, encouraging, uh, giving leadership mercy, or as New, T- New Living Translation says, showing kindness to others. Those are, those are more of like your giftings. Now, what's interesting is you would get, if you've ever done a spiritual gift assessment, one of those online things or on a piece of paper, they take all these lists. They take this list, 1 Corinthians 12 list. They'll go to Ephesians 4 even, which is the offices that God has given to the church. Uh, 1 Peter, they'll take it all and they put this big list and you answer questions and they say, you're, you're this and you're this and you're this. Uh, but the list is so weird because it's, they're not all the same lists. I'm convinced that, that when we look at 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to see something slightly different Rather than giftings, we're going to see manifestations of the Spirit. Let's read 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Now, I love 1 Corinthians, but you know, it's a corrective text. It was like, you foolish Corinthians, you're one-upping each other, trying to to show off how spiritual you are and how well-off you are. You, 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 You feast at the Lord's Supper, which used to be a meal, not just a cup and a... You feast while people who have nothing... If you Go eat at home. So he's correcting them with how they receive the Lord's Supper. He's correcting them with how they uh, use the gifts because there was manifestations of the Spirit going on in, 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 in the Corinthian church. But it was done... Uh, we'll get to it. It wasn't done in the right way. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about spiritual abilities, the Spirit gives. I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but, in the same, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given each to us so we can help each other. What, to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise counsel. Your, your translation may say uh, a, a word of wisdom. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. Once again, more formal equivalent, a word of knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and the other the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. 
It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So we have this list, the, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, uh, gift of healings, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, and interpretation. Now, if you go back to verse 1 where he says uh, this special abilities. Listen, I preach out of the New Living Translation. We'll talk about that next week. Um, because it, it, it reads well, but sometimes I don't like their choices. This is like one word in your formal equivalent Bibles. Uh, spiritual gifts, but really the, the Greek says, now regarding spirituals. Re- literally, that's what it says. Now regarding the, the spiritual things, what the Spirit does and how He operates. It's, it's, it's not charismata, it's, it's, it's pneuma, tico, pneuma to, it's, from the, it's from the root word pneuma, which means spirit. And then verse 4, we see the Spirit gives various kinds of gifts. Once again, we have a word that's related to charismata, charismaton. It's just a form of the same root word, a grift of grace. And then in the first part of verse 7, we have another word for the gift, a spiritual, this word, is phanariosis. I, I, screw, I really messed that up. My Greek is terrible. That wasn't on my resume when I submitted it to be your pastor. It should have been. I was sitting in Greek class when 9-11 happened, and people kept coming and giving us an update, and we just, that guy just kept teaching, and I think it soured me, to be honest with you. Dead to honest truth. My first semester in seminary. Okay, uh... That's my excuse, at least. All right. Um, the word here is actually manifestation. So some of your Bibles will say this, uh, uh, a, manis- a manifestation, like the ESV, something more formal equivalent. What is a manifestation? It's a means by which the Holy Spirit reveals himself, making evident his presence and his power. Now, these lists are not exhaustive lists that, re- uh, that represent every... Paul wasn't trying to say, these are all the gifts, and I'm going to name them all, and there's nothing else that exists outside of it. Uh, for instance, what we just read in 1 Corinthians 12 didn't, re- didn't, didn't mention dreams and visions, which Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost to quote Joel about the, in, in the last days. We actually sang a song. Dreaming, you know, dreams and visions, when the Spirit is poured out, that's, that's the same kind of phenomenon as what we're reading here in 1 Corinthians 12. Then the Romans 12 list doesn't list every possible way that God's give us giftings. Uh, Exodus 31 is a great example. And the Holy Spirit often would come upon like someone, and they would slaughter someone with a donkey bone. I mean, like we know that it was like a moment for, for a task. But in Exodus 31, when God gives the instructions for Moses to build the tabernacle, it says this, that God's Spirit empowered Bezalel and Ohaliab, my Hebrew's terrible too, uh, with talent and intelligence, giving them the ability to work in multiple crafts, woodworking, stoneworking, metalworking, engraving, embroidery, and weaving. They were gifted by the Spirit, something above and beyond natural abilities and talents. Now, let me, let me, let me give a warning, though. Even though this, these are not exhaustive lists, I would be slow about saying that something is your particular, like some particular talent is a spiritual gift if it's not actually identified in Scripture. But it seems like it could be a gift. It, this, perhaps God has, God has blessed me in this area. That's probably safer than... I saw a quote by a televangelist who said, it's not in the Bible, but God's given me the gift of being a televangelist. Ouch. Oh, I don't know about that. All right. Now, people take these lists and they try to categorize it. They'll say, well, look, we could take all these lists. We'll compile all these words, which have different kind of... Uh, I mean, they come from different lists for different purposes. The, the Romans 12 list, it says God gives. The 1 Corinthians 12, it's the spirit that gives. In, in Ephesians 4, it's Christ gives. But they take this and we, and we compile it and then we say, okay, let's, let's categorize them. There's, uh, so people look at the Old Testament offices and they'll say like, well, there's prophetic gifts from the prophet. Then there's priestly gifts from your priest. And then you have kingly gifts and they'll throw in the different you know, gifts that go with each of those categories. Sometimes they categorize by function. There's gifts of knowledge, speech, and gifts of power. But I think Peter, Paul says most of the stuff that we have in Scripture about gifts, but Peter just says something that I think is actually a really great way to view it. And honestly, 
I know I flew through those passages, and maybe you wanted me to break down each of those gifts. It doesn't fit in one sermon. It's probably a sermon series, and it's probably coming. I was up till 3.30 in the morning because, like, anyways. First Peter, chapter 4. I like the way Peter categorizes the gifts, kind of in two broad general categories. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. So if you have a speaking gift, then speak. You could categorize these gifts. Tongues, interpretation is speaking gifts. Then do it. They're gifts of revelation. That There's something that God has given to, to, to bring some sort of revelation uh, and then there's, there's gifts of power, which is if, you, if, if, if your gift is helping someone, then do it with the power that God's given you. But what I love about this text is not just the categories. I love the fact that this text really lays out very obviously the purpose. Take a look at this. Verse 10, God has given each of you a gift. Use them well to serve one another. And then later on, he says to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of the gifts? To serve one another, to edify one another, to build up the church, to move the kingdom forward as individuals and corporately. We actually read this in the other text. 1 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other we read that text, like, and I flew by it because I was saving it for this moment. Then Romans 12 doesn't say specifically help each other, but listen to the language that, that Paul uses in Romans 12. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other for the sake of the body. Each function contributes to the health of the whole body. It's for one another, for edifying the church. There's one thing I want you to get from this, this idea of, like, what does the Bible say about gifts? What does Radiant believe about gifts? Um, spiritual gifts are given to you by grace so they can be given by you in love. Spiritual gifts are given to you by grace so that they can be given by you in love. We haven't talked a whole lot about love, but it's an important factor in all this, and I've kind of hinted at it. But we are given spiritual gifts to, so that we can give. We're given, they're given to be given. These are not gifts that we hold for our sake. These are gifts that we give away to strengthen someone in their faith, to, to, someone to, to help someone keep the faith when, when troubles enter their life, to stay even keeled in, in life's storms, to start dealing honestly with God and themselves about their rebellious uh, stance towards God to remind others of the great love, care, and provision that God has for them, to be drawn into God's presence. There are so many ways that these gifts help one another, and there's many gifts, and there's many ways to apply those, but it's for the edification of one another, to serve one another, to build up the church. Let's talk about that love po portion of that, that big idea. Because... And I've hinted at this. The church in Corinth were operating in these manifestations of the gift of the Spirit, right? Like manifestations of the Spirit. There was tongues and there was, it was wild. It was just a, just, they're just going. And they're saying, look, look how spiritual I am. And Paul corrects them. And here's the thing. I don't want anyone to, to, to I, I'm, I'm going to, maybe I should have put this after we looked at that passage in Corinthians, but um, Spiritual gifts are not a sign of maturity. I said this a few weeks ago. Gifting and manifestations are what God does through us. But it does not equal spiritual maturity. Remember, they're gifts of grace. Not because we earned them, not because we're super mature. In fact, giftings 
and manifestations become, can become sources of spiritual pride, which is the whole other spectrum from spiritual maturity. John Oswald Sanders, who uh, led the Overseas Missions Fellowship like 100 years ago, wrote this, pride takes many forms, but spiritual pride is the most grievous. To become proud of spiritual gifts or leadership positions is to forget that all we have is from God. All the position we occupy is God's appointment. What does indicate spiritual maturity? Is it the gifts of the Spirit? No. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Let me read what Paul writes to the church in Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. It's spiritual fruit that shows maturity. Whereas gifting and, 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 and manifestations are what God does through us, fruit flows from our life by what God does in us. Now let's talk about the Corinthian church. I've picked on them. It's not my fault. They deserved it. We read the, 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 the list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. And it wasn't like Paul was like, hey, what's up? I miss you guys. Let me just, let me just mention some gifts to you out of like no context. They, they asked the question. He wants them to know there was a misuse of them. So we see in the first 11 verses of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, there's a distribution of the gifts by the same spirit. We read that. And then verse 12 through 31, we read something very similar to what he wrote in Romans chapter 12. There's one body and many members. And then in verse 27 through 28, there's yet another list, but it's kind of a mix of offices and manifestations and giftings, uh, kind of a review, kind of a compilation. But then... At the end of verse 31, at the end of this chapter, chapter 12. Now remember, he didn't write in chapters and verses. That came later. But the transition before chapter 13 is this. After explaining the gifts and its functions in the body, now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. The gifts are great. The gifts are important. God uses the gifts, edifying one another, building his kingdom. But let me show you something that's better. Your translation may say a more excellent way. Well, what is this more excellent way? That's what chapter 13 is about, which, is, which I love because how many weddings have you been to where they're like, love is patient, love is kind, and they read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a beautiful thing for weddings. Paul wasn't like, oh, by the way, when you do a wedding ceremony, you want some definition of love. Use that in your ceremony to be beautiful. His definition of love is corrective to them because they weren't operating in love when they were operating in the manifestations of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13, the verse, first three verses, there's more excellent way, and that is love. What love does and what love does not do in verses 4 through 7. This right here would be a sermon series as well. It was, it's not a rabbit trail on wedding uh, material. <laughs> He's talking about gifts, how they've conducted themselves with a lack of love. And then the, he closes out chapter 13, verses 8 through 13, talking, saying that love will last forever. Love will outlast these gifts, these manifestations. You know that. These things remain. And the greatest is love. And then we go to 14. So, List of gifts showing the importance of love. And he starts off verse 1 of chapter 14. Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. So the first five verses, he goes, he goes on to talk about how prophecy is greater than tongues. Why? Because prophecy is intelligible and tongues is not. Prophecy being intelligible is edifying because people understand what's being said. In fact, here's where I'm going to get in trouble. 
it's, it, you know that part in, in verse 20 through 25 where he's like, tongues therefore is a sign for the unbeliever, but don't do it when the unbeliever's around. <laughs> what kind of sign? We, it, it's, a, it's, it's a negative sign because he quotes from the Old Testament a, a sign of judgment with another unintelligible language. This is, if we were going to dive into this text, but I, I can't. But essentially, Paul says, tongues can be a negative sign for the unbeliever because they'll think you guys are crazy and you're mad and you made the Holy Spirit weird and they'll walk away. And it doesn't condemn them, but them walking away can be condemning. Therefore, we should worship in order. He gives restrictions on tongues in a corporate setting. Let me read verse 27 through 28. No more than two or three people should speak in tongues in their corporate gatherings. They must speak one at a time and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meetings and speak in tongues to God privately. I don't know about you, but I grew up in cultural Pentecostalism that was like the higher the emotion, the more, the more, the more, the more people speaking in tongues, the merrier. I would, I, would, I would go so far to say people would say, we're not Pentecostal, we're not, unless you hear a bunch of people praying in tongues. But, but I would say if you hear a bunch of people praying in tongues in a corporate worship service, you're not biblical. I'm going to get fired. <laughs> May love be our highest goal. May that be true of Radiant. May that be true of us. May we be filled with the Spirit. What, what's filled with the Spirit? It's not about... Filled with the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit is love being our highest goal. We, we associate filled with the Spirit with, these, with the sign gifts, and yeah, those exist, and those are, those are for today as far as I understand the side of the cessationism conversation I'm on. But it's not about that only. It's about love and the fruit. Spiritual gifts are given to you by His grace so they can be given by you in love. Let me give you a couple takeaways here. First of all, don't stress about discovering your gift. There's no how-to passage. There's no like, here's the passage where Paul says, here's how you determine what your gift is. The truth of the matter is, I think we're probably a mixture of gifts. Those gift assessments, I think, have some value, but they shouldn't tell you what God's gifting is for you. They should probably confirm what you already know, what you've discovered about yourself, what others have said is true of you. Same thing with those personality assessments. I hate those. Honestly, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I think churches give those gift assessments sometimes because it's like, oh, you have the gift of helps. You have the gift of teaching. You have the gift of this. Your perfect placement is going to be children's ministry. It doesn't matter what it says. <laughs> Whatever the score is, your perfect placement is children's ministry. I mean, churches use that stuff to staff their, their kids' ministry. Just saying. Don't stress about discovering your gift. Jump in and be yourself. See, God has created you to be who he's created you to be. He wants you to be yourself. We're probably a mix of gifts. Here's the thing. If something needs doing and you think you can help, jump in and help. Don't worry if it's your gifting or not. Jump in. Why? Because love is the more excellent way. Like one pastor said this, when the house is on fire, don't tell me what your spiritual gift is. Just grab a hose and put, the, put out the fire. I would submit that not knowing your gift, now I'm in the discovery of my gifts, can become an excuse for our inactivity or disengagement. I would also submit that knowing our gift and our giftings can be a use for inactivity because we spiritualize our laziness, we spiritualize our selfishness, we spiritualize our cowardice, or cowardice. When it comes to discovering your gift, I would, I would submit you jump in, and then you listen to the church. Perhaps the best way and the most objective way of discovering your spiritual gift is the voice of those people who watch you, who listen, who know you, who are in a, a covenant relationship, committed to you in love and loyalty. That's probably greater than any online assessment, spiritualgifts.com. I would say I wouldn't be the pastor of this church if it wasn't for, I mean, I sensed a call 
But it was a church that also kind of drew it out of me, that confirmed it. There was words of wisdom, there was words of knowledge, there was... Listen to the church. The second thing I say would be this desire to strengthen the faith of others. You see, I, I don't think the problem that we really have is that we don't know our gifting or our gift. The problem most of us have is not desiring very much to strengthen other people. What does it matter if you know your gift, if you don't desire to edify the saints, if you don't desire to, to help others? It doesn't matter if you know your gift. Our biggest problem is that our human nature makes us more prone to tear down than it is to build up. Grumbling and criticism and gossip come, come naturally. That comes easy. But edification and strengthening others, not as natural. May we seek to be the kind of people who desire to be used by God to strengthen others' faith. I think when we do, when we become that kind of person, the Holy Spirit will help us find ways to do that. And in the course of that, we find, oh, maybe this is my gifting. I want to close with reading to you what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13. I know we kind of did a, a bird's eye view. But if love's the most excellent way, if the gifts are given to us in grace, that we may give them away in love. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13. Would you stand with me as I read this? The most excellent way. If I could speak all the languages of earth and angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could not move mountains, or that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is in part and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, which if you're a cessationist, you would say that's the New Testament canon, side note, that's when Christ returns at the end of all things. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely. Just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. At 3.30 in the morning, I was like, what's the song we're going to end on? And I listened to this song in my recliner. I thought, what better song? We need a fresh wind. We need the Spirit to do a work. May we be used May we discover and, 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 and operate in the giftings that he's given us. May we be used with manifestations of the Spirit, whether it's in the church setting or in your office or in your car or in your conversation with your neighbor. I think sometimes cultural Pentecostalism, we kind of leave it in the church and we don't take it out there to build others up, to challenge others. That's another sermon altogether. But I sat there in my car and I listened. Not in my car, in my recliner. And I listened and I thought, love is the highest goal. I don't know about you, but I need the Spirit's help. The fruit of the Spirit is maturity, not the gifts. I need the Spirit's help. I need the Spirit to do a work. For some of us, it's been a long time since there's been a sense of the presence and the power. And you're getting by, because God is good. 
But I would challenge you if today you would say, I just need a touch, that we would make this our prayer. God, would you pour your spirit out? Would you do a fresh work? That we would display the fruit and the gifts and the love you've called us to. May this be our prayer, church. We need a fresh wind.